Hello everyone. In this talk, I will mostly talk about the contents of this enormous paper, which my colleague and I published last year. It's a 50-page tome, which contains an enormous amount of details about how and what methods we use to operate our machine. When we bought our machine about five years ago, we knew we had trouble. Not because of the technique itself, X-ray scattering is relatively straightforward. You will find X-ray scattering to the left of your X-ray diffraction pattern. And you can analyze this X-ray scattering to get uh, volume fractions and size distributions of your nanostructure out. This can be done to a very wide range of materials. Over the years, over the last five years, uh, we have measured an enormous spectrum of materials on our machine. Here's a short list of some of those. And these include geological materials, which can be very interesting, but also composites, rubbers, stainless steel, aluminium, light metal alloys, um, core shell and core, core, uh, core shell shell particles, um, biological materials, teeth, bone, hair, blood, you name it. Since we're only a team of essentially two full-time people working on this, it's me and my colleague Dr. Glenn Smales, um, we don't make any of these materials ourselves. We operate this machine as a sort of large, uh, small large facility and therefore we collaborate a lot with internal and external researchers. Um, these researchers are material scientists, they're specialists in their material and uh, they come to us when they would like some small angle scattering insights in their materials. The small angle scattering machines themselves are also not too complicated. Uh, all of them start with an X-ray source of one form or another, either a microfocus source or a synchrotron. A collimation section which cuts the beam down, in our case anywhere between uh, 0.2 and 0.5 millimeters. Um, we then have a very large sample chamber, in our case this is completely evacuated to reduce the background. And we have a hybrid pixel detector in a vacuum tank. Inside, when the detector is closed by the sample, that looks like this. Um, we have a lot of space inside our sample chamber as well, just in case you want to try some, uh, some nice in situ experiments if you want to introduce more environments in there. Now, the problem comes from the technique itself. We realized that if we would run this machine as you normally do, i.e. where the user is responsible for many aspects of the small angle scattering experiment, that the chances are super high that the, um, the data will never end up in a publication. And even if the data ends up in a publication, it will, uh, there's a high likelihood that this will be wrong. And it's not the fault of the material scientist. Small angle scattering, to do it right, is a very complex thing. And any mistake in any of these parts of the experiment will bring your um, experiment down. It will bring it down in such a way that you still get numbers out of your analysis, uh, but they will just be wrong. So in order to improve the efficiency of our machine, we decided that we would need to take charge of these aspects in order to get good small angle scattering experiments out. That means taking charge of all of these aspects and, uh, and adding an organizational and data handling uh, framework on top of that, including uh, um, uh, building out our tool set in terms of instrumentation and software. Now what happens is that the user comes to us, um, we advise them on how and what samples to prepare, we then do the measurements and correction, this is mostly automatic at the moment, we also do the analysis and then the user comes back to us to interpret our analysis in light of all of the other techniques that they've let loose on their materials. When we can find a coherent hypothesis for the internal structure of their material um, that agrees with all of the measurement techniques, 
we then are happy and we will publish a paper and hopefully also the data set. We're very happy about our data sets. They contain a lot of information and uh, therefore I don't mind seeing them out there. Um, now this sounds very involved uh, and there is a lot of work for us to do. However, we find that if we operate our machine in this way, we can support more people who come with better prepared samples because we taught them what to bring. <laughs> um, we measure more and better data in a more automated way. And this leads to better analyses and better interpretations of those analyses. Now, the machine that we bought, um, when it was new, it wasn't really set up for this kind of operation. Uh, it wasn't automated enough. It was set up to run your experiments in the old way, where you train a user on the machine and they sit down, do a measurement, and go back home with a USB stick full of a couple of measurements. Um, so we had to modify this. This meant that it is now a lot less beautiful, but it is a lot more effective. We have replaced a lot of hardware components. We have added a lot of hardware components. We've added vacuum feed-throughs, liquid feed-throughs for, um, for, for, for liquids, <laughs> and electrical feed-throughs for electrical connections, just in case you want that. We've added motor drives, we've replaced chillers, um, and we have added a couple of uh, we have added a couple of new stages on the inside. Most of all, however, we have removed the user interface that came with this machine, and we've replaced that with our own software, uh, which allows us to automate this machine to a very high degree. Those changes meant that over the last five years, when we've made those changes, we have increased the user uh, usability. Yeah. We have increased the using efficiency of this machine dramatically. So efficiency here is relatively simply defined as the amount of time that we're spending exposing our detector for sample measurements. And you can see that this year, 2022, we are leaving all the previous years in the dust. We are um, on track for spending 69% of our year, of the hours and minutes in a year, um, doing sample measurements. And this is uh, quite a high performance. Now, I think this is pretty much the limit as to what we could get with machines like this, with the team that we have. Um, however, I still think this is quite a commendable performance. Now, we're not just measuring a lot, but this also results in uh, quite a few papers, which of course makes uh, the powers that be very happy. And these papers also get cited quite a bit, so that makes us very happy. It uh, gives us the idea that we're doing useful research. Now, of course, I am sugarcoating things. Things aren't always working. It's a, this machine is a complex um, a combination of parts and software, and everything has to work. Um, we're understaffed and overloaded, um, and you know there is trouble every now and then. However, we do get uh, glimpses of how this whole procedure can work, and when we see it work in practice, it is very convincing. For example, last year we were contacted out of the blue by uh, the Furukawa lab uh, from Japan, um, who mentioned that they had some really cool framework gels and they would like some small angle scattering insights on those. So we said, oh, that sounds very interesting. In that case, we will need these samples, this tick, etc., etc., including things like precursors and ungelled material and all kinds of components that would allow us later on to pick apart the scattering, uh, to pick apart the scattering pattern and identify individual species in there. We also asked them to fill in a sample form. These are relatively detailed sample forms in which they need to provide information on each phase in their sample. Um, that means atomic compositions, densities, volume, fractions, etc. This is... Um, th and they actually do fill this in. We tell them, well, if you fill this in, we will be able to help you, because this helps us with our data corrections. 
Then it's up to us. We load the samples in our sample holders. We have these strips. They can hold 16 samples. We can load up to three strips in a rack for a total of 48 samples. We configure the measurements. This means we fill in our electronic logbook. This is an Excel sheet um, where we specify every uh, series of measurements. And then we load that up, uh, convert that to a script, load it up to, on our machine, and then we let it rip. That means that the machine is occupied for uh, up to three weeks at a time for a full set of samples. Why so long though? That is a considerable amount of time. And that is because we do things rather rigorously. We take measurements of 10 minutes at a time. We repeat these measurements 8 to 30 times, depending on what configurations we're in. Um, and for every repetition, we get a new beam profile, a new flux, a new transmission factor. This allows us to check the stability of the machine and the stability of the sample afterwards with simple statistical checks. Once this is done, we move to the next sample, repeat the whole process. Once all of, that, all of those samples are measured, the machine changes configuration. Everything is motorized, so it can do this automatically. We do this at least four times. We measure all the samples in the full range, because why not? Um, and if we use two of our sources, we have a copper and molybdenum source, this can go up to six or eight configurations. Over these three weeks, we then collect thousands and thousands of data files, hundreds of gigabytes of data files. Um, we are currently measuring at a rate of about 10 terabytes a year, which for a laboratory instrument isn't all that bad, I think. This, of course, I do not process by hand. That would be insane. So what we do, we take whatever data files we get from the machine, and there's a couple of them, we convert them to compatible Nexus. Uh, this is an HDF5 container. These raw measurements are then uploaded to our SciCat database. This is a copy of uh, a development that's going on at the moment at the European Spallation Source. And this is quite handy because if we upload this, um, it means that we can then search our metadata and we can, for example, search for measurements where the transmission factor is remarkably low, say less than 10%. We can apply this filter and then we can dig into the raw measurements and the metadata thereof to find out what exactly was the origin of this. So these databases can be very handy. These are the raw measurements. We then correct these raw measurements uh, headlessly in Dawn using standard pipelines. Now Dawn is a data analysis workbench. This is a Java package which is um, uh, maintained by the Diamond Light Source. And together with them uh, we developed a modular data correction system which appears to be universal. We have applied this data correction procedure to all of the samples that you saw above and uh, it works consistently for all samples and consistently gives us good data on absolute units with uncertainty estimates. We're not the only ones who use this. This is also in use at the Diamond Light Source i22 and their offline um, SACS beamline and we know that the data that we get is comparable with the data that they get. We can actually combine the data sets from our various instruments. So that uh, data correction procedure is quite uh, is, is quite powerful. Now, Java is not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, however, I have it on good authority that there is a Python library in preparation which um, will, uh, with, which, with which you will be able to apply the same modular data correction steps, uh, but then in Python. So I'm very much looking forward to that. All right, so things are corrected then. We upload the corrected data to our SciCat catalog as well, and this is linked to the raw files uh, so that the, 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 the hereditary uh, of these data files is maintained. Um, and then we merge the data if appropriate. That means that uh, since we collect uh, in different instrument geometries, we have different ranges, and I've come up with a statistical method to combine all these data sets into a continuous curve um, with the best possible uncertainties on these. 
This can't be done for every sample, but for some samples this is possible, and in that case you get a beautiful curve spanning almost four decades in, in Q, therefore we have almost four decades in size information there. Right, then we do the analysis. I won't spend too much time on this, this is a whole other topic. Um, typically we take a look at our data and we fit it either with MaxSAS or with SASFIT. Um, we then uh, get size distributions, volume fractions out, population statistics. Um, we then interpret these results together with the material scientists, uh, make some hypotheses about uh, what is actually going on over there, make pretty pictures, um, which then end up in papers and everybody's happy. All right, so that is pretty efficient. efficient. Um, we're not completely done yet. We've done a lot, but we're not completely done. There's always more to do. For example, we would like to be able to assist the design of our experiments by pre-calculating uh, scattering patterns in cases where we're not sure whether things are going to work. This means that we can use uh, SASView or my program the Sponge to calculate scattering patterns in absolute units and, uh, and compare these calculated scattering patterns with uh, the background levels of our instrument. And then we can immediately see whether we will get a good signal to background ratio, and whether it's worth trying these experiments on our machine. If not, we can tell in advance that maybe they can go to some of our colleagues with brighter sources or better back, uh, signal to background ratios. We can improve the measurement capabilities in terms of uh, improving the range and flexibility of our machine. In terms of flexibility, we have uh, these uh, plates in our sample chamber on kinematic feet that are very reproducibly placeable, on which we can put, uh, for example, electrical breakout boards for electrical connections, grazing incident stages, um, but also uh, we're developing an ultra-small angle scattering stage, an inexpensive ultra-small angle scattering stage, with which we hope to increase our uh, measurement range by another decade. Now, we have tested this, um, quite a while ago and it works, but I'm not 100% happy with the design, so I'm redesigning these rotations once more. I think I'm at version 4 at the moment. Um, after the correction, and this is something we actually already are doing, where we can automatically flag common problems uh, so that we don't have to investigate when we notice something about the data. We can have uh, problems automatically um, automatically flagged, so we know which measurements to repeat. This includes things like low, high or unstable transmission factors, unstable fluxes. Um, if our machine is not stable, it's usually stable, but you know, there are, it has its moments. Um, if there is no signal or no significant signal above the background, or if you get something like negative signal after correction, which means that you've chosen the wrong background, or your background, which you thought, would not change, is actually changing, like in the example shown here. All right, in terms of analysis, analysis really is our bottleneck. This is where we spend most of our time, uh, unfortunately. We can help by automatically analyzing our scattering patterns, at least a precursory analysis. We hope to be able to do uh, feature detection in our scattering patterns, also a clustering of scattering patterns, and for this we're looking towards our, our data catalog and um, our new collaboration with our American colleagues. We can try and do a quick standard MaxAS run, MaxAS fits most things, and gives you an idea about the sizes that are involved. We can also do um, advanced analyses, and these are really bespoke depending on which sample we're doing. We can now, for example, simulate scattering patterns from any kind of shape that you have, combine that simulation with MaxSAS, and then you can uh, find out what polydispersity, what, what size dispersity you have for those curious shapes. So if you have uh, pizza slices, nano pizza slices, that you want to analyze. We can calculate how that scatters, combine it with MaxAS3, and we can get you a size distribution and maybe even a volume fraction out for your nano pizza slices. All right. In conclusion, um, 
I've talked about a lot of different things. We've taken a holistic approach to the whole small angle scattering experiment, but I do think this makes sense because it allows you to get high quality results and it makes it so much more likely that the sometimes really, really cool results um, actually end up in scientific literature. So with that, if you have any questions, please do contact me. Uh, I would like to thank the X-ray scattering community be, uh, for being the amazing community that they are. Glenn Smales, Ingo Bressler, Sofia Lashkina as well for their help in some of the aspects of this. Uh, our, user, yeah, our users and collaborators for always bringing us really awesome materials. Um, Reviewer3, which who said that many national labs do useless research, my institute for letting me do useless research, and you for listening to my talk. Thank you all very much. <laughs>